the countdown to the showdown at the nation's highest court. Final preparations for the most crucial moment yet in the battle for the White House. Their voice is final. They have the power to decide this. I think that regardless of who wins, that our democracy is strong enough and our country will move forward. Israel prepares for new elections, forced by Prime Minister Barack's resignation. And urban meets rural in Texas at a church on a mission to help kids in need. We just jumps in, gang tackling, trying to remedy the problem. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News, reported by John Siegenthaler. Good evening, everyone. 33 days after the election, the nation's highest court is facing a momentous decision which could determine the next president. Tomorrow, lawyers for Al Gore and George W. Bush head into the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington to argue the case. The Bush team is asking the justices to reverse Florida's Supreme Court decision, which ordered a recount of thousands of disputed ballots. The Gore team claims voters have a right to have those ballots counted. So in Florida, the counting remains on hold while the country waits for a decision. We begin our coverage with NBC's Kelly O'Donnell in Tallahassee. Good evening, Kelly. John, tonight the Democratic National Committee is flying in voters from South Florida and urging others to make the drive to Tallahassee, a show of support for the hand counts to begin again on the eve of arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court. Candles in place of counting. Count every vote. Tonight, Democrats from around Florida use the public library, the scene of the halted hand count, as a backdrop for protest. Uh, the count must go on. Democrats here to urge Florida's Republican-dominated legislature not to intervene when lawmakers hold a special session tomorrow to consider naming a Bush slate of electoral college voters since he was certified the winner here in Florida. Republican lawmakers say if the U.S. Supreme Court does not resolve the election, they will act. We must proceed and we must be ready, and that's exactly what we need to, we need to do. Earlier today, a special delivery to the U.S. Supreme Court. Under uniformed guard, 18 boxes of evidence and exhibits from the election contest trial flown in from Florida. Everything but the ballots. There have been no orders from any court requiring that the ballots be transferred from here to any other place. Those 9,000 disputed Miami-Dade undervotes abruptly packed and sealed Saturday when the hand count was called off remain in Tallahassee. Morning. No comment today from Vice President Gore attending church, while his top lawyer suggested the Tuesday deadline for Florida's selection of electors could slide. To some extent, both sides have already said this is going to go beyond December 12th. In fact, the Florida legislature is talking about possibly taking some action on December 13th or December 14th. So I think the December 12th deadline is important, but it's not nearly as critical as the December 18th deadline. December 18th is when the Electoral College actually meets. Today in Austin, George W. Bush stepped outside briefly to greet a crowd gathered at the governor's mansion, while his advisor, former Secretary of State James Baker, was holding firm on both dates. You can't extend that deadline. It's, it's in the Constitution, or at least it's in federal law. Making that point in another way, today Bush running mate Dick Cheney visited their transition office just outside Washington. Another subtle but public way to indicate their view. The end is near. The vice president's lawyer, David Boies, acknowledged today the urgency, saying if the U.S. Supreme Court does not lift its stay, allowing the vote counting to continue, in his words, it's the end of the road. John? NBC's Kelly O'Donnell, thanks. Now to Washington and NBC's chief law correspondent, Dan Abrams, on the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court. Dan, what do we expect to hear from the Bush team tomorrow? Well, the Bush team has argued that the Florida Supreme Court opinion was out of line. They refer to it as a crazy quilt ruling. They say there were no uniform standards, that rules were changed. The effect, quote, it has created a regime virtually guaranteed to incite controversy, suspicion, and lack of confidence. Now, as expected, they also said that there were violations of the U.S. Constitution and a federal statute. But now they say there's another problem. They say this opinion was built on a nullified case that Florida ruling the U.S. Supreme Court vacated earlier this week. They say without that, none of these recounts could have or would have happened. John? 
And Dan, this could be an uphill battle for the Gore team, right? Uh, no question. The court is already uh, implied that there's an inclination towards ruling for Bush. Uh, they're in essence saying there was nothing wrong here with the Florida Supreme Court's ruling, that there's no federal issue here, no rules were changed. And they say, quote, the court engaged in a routine exercise of statutory interpretation that construed the Florida election code. Now, as for the lack of standards, those dimpled, uh, hanging chads, they say that's really the norm in most states in the nation, and it's not unique to Florida. John? NBC's Dan Abrams in Washington. Dan, thank you. Now, a brief program note. NBC News coverage of tomorrow's historic event begins at 11 a.m. Eastern time when the Supreme Court session is set to start. The justices will release an audio tape of the proceedings shortly after the 90-minute hearing ends, and we will bring you that to the moment it becomes available. To Capitol Hill now, where it is feared that feuds stemming from this battle for the White House will continue long after Inauguration Day. Here's NBC's Joe Johns. The supercharged atmosphere the next president will have to live with is a hot topic on Capitol Hill these days. The only way that either man can establish legitimacy is to reach out and try to reach the kind of consensus that is so critical among parties and among all people. It's important for us in the Congress who are not happy with the, the final outcome to cooperate in trying to, to be civil with those who did win. But how to do that, especially with narrow majorities in the incoming 107th Congress, particularly in the Senate, where there will be a 50-50 split if Gore loses and Joe Lieberman returns to Capitol Hill. Democrats want a power-sharing arrangement, co-equal status. Republicans offer concessions, but... You can't have uh, co-everything because basically you could checkmate each other at every turn. Republicans say they would still control the agenda, however, because Vice President Dick Cheney would cast the tie-breaking votes if Bush wins the White House. The vote would be 51 to 50. There would be a Republican majority. Republicans stand to gain an extra seat if Gore wins. No worries about a 50-50 split. Still, with both parties sending their rank and file, even their staffs, to wage the PR war in Battlefield, Florida, the tension and partisan anger has been raised to new heights, some say even worse than during the impeachment of President Clinton. The Republicans and Democrats have different approaches to top agenda items, including tax cuts, Social Security reform, and both sides say they want cooperation, not gridlock. I think the people want us to work together very badly. Legislatively, both sides in Congress appear poised to wage new battles on the same old terms. One significant difference, more Democrats in both houses, as they wait to find out who will be sitting in the White House. Joe Johns, NBC News, the Capitol. When NBC Nightly News continues in a moment, the political maneuvering in Israel. Finally tonight, with the outcome of Florida's election and the presidency itself on the Supreme Court's agenda tomorrow, the thoughts of some Floridians whose votes were not counted. Residents of Jacksonville in Duval County. Their story from NBC's Carrie Sanders. At the Day Spring Baptist Church this morning, a lingering question. What happened to their votes? We have fought too hard to get a right to vote. People have died trying to get people to vote. And then when it comes time for us to make a change, we don't count. On election day in Florida, a near record turnout. But when the ballots were tallied in Jacksonville's black precincts, a problem emerged. 27,000 ballots thrown out. In some black precincts, one in three ballots disqualified, compared to heavily white precincts, where just one in 14 ballots was thrown out. Corinne Brown is the congresswoman in those Jacksonville neighborhoods where the votes did not count. I don't know what caused it, but the end results is that throughout the state of Florida, thousands of African Americans have uh, not been able to vote or their vote have not been able to count. Elections officials here admit the ballots themselves may have caused confusion. Instructions on the sample ballots mailed to every voter said, vote all pages. The sample showed all 10 candidates for president on one page. But the election day ballot was different. Page one had only five candidates for president. Page two had the other five. Anyone who voted on all pages as instructed ended up voting twice in the presidential race. That's called an overvote. 
We agree that it's very unfortunate that any vote not count due to an overvote. Um, we do believe, however, that the injection of race as an explanation for this is unfair, and it's also not productive. The Justice Department is looking into the vote irregularities in Florida. We as a people are not set back by these things. Pastor Moses Javis knows what it is to fight what the mainstream may dismiss as irrelevant. In the 1960s, he worked for a presidential commission integrating schools in Alabama. I think the system has committed a crime. But here in Duval County, promises from elections officials this will not happen again. And they say they will buy new voting equipment before the next presidential election. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Jacksonville.